Good morning, everyone, uh, and happy Thursday. My name is Jairo Rodriguez, and I have the honor of serving as your 2021 North Central Jersey Association of Realtors President. I want to welcome you to our first of many Hot Topic webinar live series. I hope that in the near future, we'll be able to do these in person because I miss seeing everyone's face. Uh, but in the meantime, we have it here as a webinar option for us to be able to conduct this. Uh, we have put together today an amazing uh, and very accomplished a panel for you today. And what I'd like to add is that any of the comments or opinions said today of our very own. Uh, here at Nice Jar, we are a very big family and the knowledge base that makes up our membership is what makes us an organization that is so strong and so powerful. Uh, we're here for each and every one of you. We are here to listen to your ideas. We're thankful for the questions that you have provided. And before we officially get started, I wanna just mention three key things that you'd like to circle on your calendar or put down at, on your notes uh, if you have something in front of you. June 30th, that's just right around the corner, our leadership applications are due. If you or anyone you know has an interest in serving as a trustee on our board, uh, please have them fill out the application and submit or send a resume along with a uh, recommendation if possible. Second thing, July 19th is the deadline for our license renewal. Please make sure that you or any of your agents have the questionnaire completed. And then last and certainly not least, uh, September 21st, we're going to have our annual golf outing. And I believe this is the 30th one. So we're proud of continuing this tradition. It will be at Black Bear Mountain, September 21st. Don't forget. Can't wait to see you guys there. Uh, with that, I'd like to start the introduction of the amazing panel that we have today. Uh, first and foremost, we have our very own Mr. Bill Hanley. He's been licensed since 1984. He's the current manager of prominent property Sotheby's in Westfield. And he's also the commissioner, a commissioner at the, North, uh, the New Jersey uh, Real Estate Commission. Uh, thank you, Bill, for that. Secondly, we have Mr. Gary Large. His career in real estate spans more than 45 years. <laughs> He's a licensed instructor, certified as an expert in the common law of agency, and a director at, RSO, at the uh, North Central Jersey Association of Realtors School of Business. Also served as the president of our state association in 2012. We also have on our panel, Mr. Bob Kimplin. He's the executive director of Garden State MLS and has been since 2016. Previous to that, he was director of IT for the Garden State MLS from 1992 to 2016. And last and certainly not least, we have Mr. Jeffrey, as we like to call him, Jeff Dollinger. He's been practicing real estate law since 1980. Throughout that time, he's had the privilege of representing mortgage lenders, title companies, investors, individual buyers and sellers. And dare I say that we've been lucky enough to have Jeff represent us here at the North Central Jersey Association of Realtors. And a fun fact, actually, is that in 1999, he actually co-founded the Foundation for Diabetes Research in Livingston. Thank you, all panelists. Uh, with that, we'd like to get started with some of the questions that we've had come in. Um, and I'd start with Gary, if it's OK. Um, what does it mean, Gary, in terms of the North, uh, New Jersey Real Estate Commission regulations? Like, can a broker, branch, office manager manage more than one branch or an office? Gary, you're muted. You would figure as an instructor, I'd know better because I give that advice all the time in my classes. I said, Iro, that is a great question. And the answer to the last part of it, as you asked specifically, can a branch manager physically supervise more than one office is no, they cannot. The commission's regulations are very clear that either the broker or their designated manager must be physically present in the office during normal business hours, unless they're called away to go out into the field and assist an associate with business or they're on vacation. So it's impossible for one person to be physically present in two offices. And if you wouldn't mind my hitchhiking, because I want to just lay this as a foundational cornerstone, because I know that so much of what we're going to talk about today has to do with broker oversight. And the commission addresses that in its rules and regulations in section 4.2, which is titled Broker Supervision and Oversight of Individual Licensees, Office Operations, and Escrowed Monies. And the 
key to that section is in paragraph A1, which says this, the commission holds responsible individual brokers for any actions of the broker's licensee or any in person employed by or licensed through the broker licensee taken in pursuit of its real estate brokerage business, which violates any provision of the real estate license law. And this responsibility applies regardless of where the person licensed through that broker engages in the pursuit of the business. So I don't care how many offices you have, how big you are, how many associates you employ as a broker, Commissioner Hanley is not going to entertain as a defense. Well, that happened in an office 10 miles from where I'm based. How would I know what was going on? Well, the commission would say, we don't, it's not our job to tell you how to supervise your business, but you do have to supervise your business. Gary, I think we all learned something there is that we have such amazing documents that we can go back to, to reference. And I'd like to encourage everyone that's watching today uh, to make sure that we continuously uh, go over those uh, to refresh our minds on some of those things that we oftentimes uh, forget. So thank you. Yeah, for if I could make a suggestion, President Hiro, of all of the commission rules and regulations are found in NJAC 11 colon 5, which is the 11th volume, fifth chapter when we used to use books. But if you go to the commission's website, you can purchase a copy of both the real estate license law and the entire statute book. I think it's, Bill, you can vouch for this on me. I think it's $10 or something like that. And every broker manager, every broker should have a copy of both the real estate license law and the commission regulations in a three ring binder in their office at all times. That's my personal opinion. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. And if Bill, if I can ask a question in regards to advertising, and it's a, it's somewhat of a hot topic, obviously, as we're discussing it here, uh, what are the general requirements for advertising uh, according to the New Jersey regulations? As Gary mentioned, you know, everybody should have a copy of the rules and regulations and they should have it handy because this is 11561, which has everything to do with advertising and the advertising rules. When we talk about the advertising, it includes all publications, radio, television, websites, electronic media, email, internet, business stationery, anything that you can do that people are going to see, including billboards, there are rules and regulations that go with it. And going back to one thing that Gary said, you know, the broker is responsible to check and look over what everybody is doing. All of that should have to be approved. And keep in mind, there are places that you are having your websites created that are not in New Jersey. The rules are different every place. Okay, so if you have somebody who is creating your website and say they're from California and they don't believe that you have to have the broker's name on the website or a way to get back to the broker, you're going to be in violation and you will be held responsible for that. So when you're looking at their websites, when you're approving their advertising, please make sure that everything there is according to what is on, actually I'll say page 82 at this point, with advertising rules and regulations to make it easier for you to find. Also, teams. Teams are a big topic right now. A team member cannot advertise as if they, they are their own brokerage. So when they're doing their advertising, when they're doing their signs, the signs are what I'm seeing as the biggest um, offender right now. The sign has the team name, it has the team phone number, and it's all very big. And then in the small print on the bottom, it talks about where they work and where the broker is. Okay, there is no small print when it comes to who you're working for. Everything should be as predominant, at least the same size as what your brokerage is and who you're going to. Um, so I think the, the, the biggest takeaway from this is brokers, I know it's tough because I will look on Facebook pages, I look on people's websites, um, and it's scary to see what's on some people's websites, including people in the office, my own office, because things happen and they do things all the time without the knowledge of what can be done. So I would recommend that you would have a meeting that would just talk about the advertising rules and regulations so you're beginning to get yourself covered on what we're going to be looking at as a commission and what your responsibility is going to be. 
And Mr. President, if I can hitchhike very quickly, because I agree whole, wholeheartedly with Commissioner Hanley, but I want to make a point that the, the rules are very specific. If this is a non-social media ad, then the broker's name, and I'll just read it right out of the book, has to appear in wording that is larger than or displayed in a more prominent manner than the name of the individual licensee or team. That's in like billboards, prints and things. If it's social media, as Bill said, the information about the broker has to be the same size as the predominant size of the information on that web page. It can't be buried in the fine print that you need a magnifying glass to figure out who the broker is. And unfortunately, inadvertently or advertently, I don't know, too many teams and too many top producers are doing everything in their power to make it appear as though they're the broker and that they don't really work under the supervision of a broker. And that's just not the case in New Jersey. Thank you for bringing that up and clarifying that a little bit. Um, are, while we're on that topic, are we able to discuss what, um, are there fines associated if anybody uh, were to get reported on anything like that? Well, I'll refer that one to C Commissioner Hanley. He ought to know. Yes, there are fines. But what happens, it would happen with the first offense, second offense, exactly what it is. There's not a rule book on what's a $1,000 fine, what's a $2,000 fine, what's a $10,000 fine. But there are fines that would be put in place. And again, the fine is going to the broker. The agent may get fined also, but bottom line, the broker must supervise what the, the agents are doing. And that's what we're really paying a lot of attention to now and looking at. Are the agents being supervised now and who is the person in charge? And as Gary said, in teams, that's gonna be the biggest question. Even though people have people who are quote unquote under them, think of it as a pyramid. You have the broker of record who's on top, you have your manager who's next, then however they do their team situations, that's fine, but those two people are the two people that are gonna be held accountable. And again, if I can hitchhike with Commissioner Hanley, don't lose sight of the fact that the commission also has the ability to give you a vacation from your license. If the um, violation is egregious enough, they can suspend and in some cases even revoke your license for a period of time. Or in some cases, I've seen the commission revoke someone's license for life. Well, if you look, if, if you look on the Real Estate Commission website, you can actually see what the decisions have been and what's coming down. And you will see recently there are people who we have suspended their license, not necessarily for advertising rules and regulations, but it's been suspended for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. We have taken people's license away. We have uh, not granted people being able to get their broker license or their license. And the fines have been pretty hefty lately, you know, $2,500 to $5,000. Well, that is definitely a hot topic, and I'm sure you guys took away, you know, uh, maybe a best practice to have, whether it's a quarterly um, or biannually, um, some type of training specifically to, to in regards to advertising. So thank you for that. Um, if we may, let's shift a little bit. And Jeff, um, I have a question for you. Um, what are the legal requirements concerning criminal and or background checks for rentals? Jeff, you're muted too. Of course, and I, had it, I had it right on there so I wouldn't forget. Okay, um, New Jersey has passed a law. It has not been signed by the governor yet, but I think we're the first in the nation to pass this. And what it says in simple terms is that a landlord must first take an application without asking any questions about a criminal record. At the time of that application, if they find the information to be satisfactory, they can issue a conditional approval, not a final approval, but a conditional approval. So, so far at that moment, they're not entitled to do any criminal background check. Once they give the conditional approval, at that point, they may, but they cannot consider anything. The, the statute that's passed both houses, but not yet signed by the governor, says that they can only look at criminal convictions which have taken place in the last 10 years and which are not expungeable. Expungement is when, you know, you get caught shoplifting and you're otherwise a good person. And after a period of time, you can apply through the court system to have it removed from your record. And then you're legally able to lie in the future when you're asked, have you ever been convicted? If it was something that was expungeable, like shoplifting, you could then legally say, no, I haven't. 
Well, the ones that are not expungeable are the real serious ones. I mean, we're talking about murder and uh, treason, manslaughter, kidnapping, raping, that kind of stuff. So my reading of the statute is, and, and only for the last 10 years, I think I mentioned that. If, if after the conditional approval, you find that one of those have occurred within the last 10 years, you then get to the next step, which is to consider the severity, the time that's elapsed since, the, since it, the degree to which you believe reasonably it would affect the safety of other tenants. And then you do have the right to decline that, uh, that lease to that person. Now, it does not apply to owner-occupied properties of three units or less. So they can do whatever they want. They can't discriminate. They can't say, oh, this person is old. Uh, they must have had a criminal event or the wrong color or the wrong religion. No, 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 that they can't do. But otherwise, they can have a general policy of looking into criminal records if it is owner-occupied, owner-occupied, and three or fewer. And yes, there are fines. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it, again, it hasn't been signed by the governor as of when I last checked yesterday, but the fines start at $1,000 for the first offense, and then naturally they go up after that. So we are the first in the nation to say you cannot immediately go to a criminal check and say, no, 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 goodbye. No, you have to first look at the other aspects and issue a conditional approval, and then you have the option. If you're, you know, within that definition beyond three uh, units or fewer, but not owner occupied, if it's a non expungeable offense. Thank you for that, Jeff. Now, as you mentioned, I, I want to kind of highlight a little bit of that um, owner occupant um, three units or less that you had mentioned. I, I just want to kind of emphasize that us as real estate licensed practitioners. Um, we still have to educate our clients on particular uh, rules and regulations that still uh, hold true because we are, are held responsible to that. Now, Gary or Bill, would you like to kind of uh, speak on that a little when it comes to discrimination or fair housing? I think one of the biggest things that people have to keep in mind is, you know, they talk about uh, if it's an owner-occupied property, a person is able to make decisions on who is going to live in that property if, it, if they also occupy it. However, what doesn't change is that as licensees in the state of New Jersey, you don't get a get out of jail card with this. You have to actually return the, the, the listing to somebody if you know that's what they're doing. They can't advertise as a homeowner that they're going to discriminate. So it's, it's a very slippery slope and you don't want to get yourself find losing your license or, or have any group come after you for a rental. <laughs> I mean, that makes no sense to me at all. And there's often a lot of confusion between the federal law, which has four exemptions, which involve both sale and rental, none of which is applicable in New Jersey versus the New Jersey law, which only has two exemptions, both of which deal only with rentals. And as Commissioner Hanley said, only involve if the homeowner or the landlord, landlord landlord is living either in the property itself if they're renting a room or an apartment in their home or it's two family the max in new jersey is two family so you have to be careful and not let your associates be confused between between what they hear in training about the federal law and what they hear about the, the new jersey law against discrimination and one more thing in both the federal and state case because of the Supreme Court decision in 1968 in the case of Jones versus Mayer, you cannot discriminate on the basis of race or color no matter what, even if the law gives you that exemption. Because the Supreme Court said the Civil Rights Act of 1866 prohibits any form of racial discrimination without exception. Perfect. Thank you very much for clarifying on that. Now, we do have two questions that came in as we were speaking, um, and I'd like to address the first one. Um, uh, and, the, and that is NTN is a service used by many landlords through brokerages as a way of betting, if you will. Is this something we should reconsider since their search includes background checks of some sort? Um, I, I would say, no, you shouldn't abandon them. Just remember that the information you receive can be used in the limited way that I described. 
So I, I probably would not contact them if I were you until the landlord, your client has otherwise given a conditional approval. Because if you do, if you contact them too soon and then you get challenged later, it might appear like you were violating the law or the intent of the law, even though you have it. So you can still deal with them and probably should, but not until there's a conditional approval. Right. Can I also hop onto that also? The on NTN, you have an option of what link you're going to send them, whether or not you're going to include a background check or a criminal report. So just send them the one. I wouldn't be going into the other one until, like Jeff says, until afterwards. If that's something that they want to do after you have some agreements, yeah, great. But I wouldn't touch it beforehand. That makes sense. Thank you for that, too. And one other thing came on uh, while we're still on that topic. So if we issue a conditional approval, we can then do a criminal or background check, question mark. Need some clarity on that. Yes. Once oh, yeah. you've gotten the conditional approval, you absolutely can do that criminal check, but you can only use it to deny a lease if it's something within 10 years and it's serious enough to be non-expungible. And if your client otherwise reasonably believes based on the nature and severity, the age, and the degree to which it could impact other tenants, if they feel that that is a, a danger to other tenants, it could legally be used as a reason to say no to that tenant, even after conditional approval has been given. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Dollinger. Now to shift a little bit more, this is something that uh, uh, I'm sure everyone's gonna be eager to, to listen in on. Uh, Mr. Bob Kimplin, can you discuss for us uh, the purpose of the coming soon that we have now. Yeah, so coming soon, um, I know a lot of people have the impression that it's limited to just preparing the property. Um, that's not the case. We, we don't have any limit on why it's in coming soon. Um, it goes back to generating kind of a marketing frenzy um, for the property. Um, for GSMLS, you have to file the delayed showing form. So the homeowner's got to be aware of it. Your broker's got to be aware of it. Um, and you can't show the property during the coming soon status. Um, if anyone's ever able to provide proof of that, we'll issue the appropriate fines. We'll follow up with the listing office to make sure that they're aware of the rule uh, and following the rule. Thank you. And I, I want to add to the uh, attendance to this uh, webinar. If you can ask the questions in the Q&A tab, uh, the chat, it might take a little longer. If you go into the q and I, I have that one up uh, right away. So thank you for that. Um, we had a couple questions come in in regards to the NTN once more, if I'd like to, if I can shift back to that, if that's okay. Uh, one is uh, NTN does a credit and civil check. Uh, a criminal check is separate and add-on. I'm assuming they mean on the NTN program, uh, that's a, add-on platform, I guess, to the NTN. There's another charge that goes with that. It's two exactly. different charges. Exactly. Next part, does this apply to commercial as well? Huh, good question. I would say no. Um, let me just take a quick look because it deals with housing providers. So by that term, I would say it does not apply to commercial. And if I could hitchhike on that, for a moment, Hiro, because there's a tremendous amount of confusion about that here in the state of New Jersey. Right. The federal fair housing law deals with housing. So technically, a purely commercial property is not under the jurisdiction of the law. If it's a combination like a first floor retail shops and then second floor apartments and condos, then yes, it's considered housing by the federal law. In New Jersey, we make no such distinction all types of properties are considered covered by the law against discrimination. So you need to have to be, you have to be a little careful there because again, some folks hear what they want to hear and they hear that the federal law only affects me if I have housing in my building. Well, that's true, but the New Jersey law makes no distinction. Yeah, I just rechecked. It, it's it's accurate. It, the the statute says a rental dwelling unit. It's a dwelling unit offered for rent by a housing provider for residential purposes. Thank you for looking that up, and thank you for adding that on, uh, Gary. 
uh, in continuation with this topic, uh, it definitely is a hot topic. Uh, so initially, I guess this is for clarity. Initially, we can ask for credit scores and employment verification, then conditional if background. They're supposed to be then conditional of background, et cetera. That's accurate, right? Yeah, this law did not change anything with regard with respect to that. Only with respect to the criminal background check did it did it act. Okay, and I think this would probably be the last one for this topic. Um, what types of drug charges are considered serious? Uh, that I couldn't really answer because I don't know that that was. I, I would have to answer that question by saying whatever drug charges, if any, are non-expungible. I would guess if I had to, if I was taking a bar exam now, panicking, I would say distribution, sale, certainly not use, I would guess, because I believe most of those would be expungible. So it's the most serious one. And you could find this if you Google probably New Jersey criminal expungible acts. It's E-X-P-U-N-G, expungible. And, and if they are expungible, they may not be used to deny the tenant. Oh, that's perfect. And I'd like to mention as well to our attendees here, um, if you ask questions and we do not get to them during the session, again, this is the first of hopefully many that we'll have. Um, we'll take the ones that you have asked and bring them forward in the future. Or if there might be something that we cannot answer during this live session, uh, we'll take that, uh, research it and get back to you the next time. Uh, with that, Bob, we have a co couple of questions for you in regards to coming soon. Uh, how can proof be provided for a coming soon? So most typically that's text messaging back and forth with the listing agent saying that people that saw the property, right? Um, so if it's obvious that it was shown and there's something in writing or email, um, we can use that. I, we, we need to evaluate it, right? But just the fact that it closed while it was, or went under contract while it was coming soon, doesn't mean that somebody didn't make an offer sight unseen. Sure. Uh, one more question about the coming soon. How should a broker address status showing coming soon published in the MLS, then showing under contract on the date published as first day available to show? Again, we, we would need to know the, the answer that we've gotten so far from people that have come have been in that situation is it was an offer that was sight unseen. Um, if we can prove otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up on it. Sure, thank you. And I'm seeing a couple of the questions have been answered uh, as we're continuing to speak on the topic. Uh, with that, uh, we have a question in regards to Teams, which was an earlier question that came up. Um, the question is, if Teams are not recognized at no, uh, the New Jersey Real Estate Commission, then why are they allowed to advertise on signs? Wouldn't that be considered misrepresentation? Well, I, I don't think I said they don't recognize teams. Teams is something that's certainly being talked about on how they're to be monitored. But no one is saying, and the Real Estate Commission did not say that they cannot have a team. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Bill. Uh, Jeff, we'll, we have some of the questions that we're going to answer that were asked previous to the live session. Um, so we'll go right back to that for the sake of time. Um, Jeff, can you speak on appraisal slash inspection waivers that we're continually, continuously seeing on contracts of sales? Yes, I will try not to vent my anger at this one. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult situation for all of us, the attorneys especially included during attorney review on both of those two issues. Let me talk about the appraisal first. We are seeing routinely now contracts that say buyer waives appraisal contingency. I still offer a reward to anyone who can point to the appraisal contingency in the realtor form contract. It does not exist. Having said that, I know what you're all thinking. The mortgage application has several parts. They have to prove assets, income, creditworthiness, and the value of the collateral, the appraised value of the property, including the house. I get that. So what are you really trying to say when you say uh, we waive the appraisal? I think what you're trying to say, and I'm going to refer to my own language that I use during attorney review, 
what you're trying to say is if the buyers, let's assume it's a $500,000 property with a $400,000 mortgage contingency, 480%. If the buyer's mortgage is approved, but for an amount less than that 400,000 that we just said we have to have, solely due to a low appraisal, the buyer will be contractually obligated to accept that lower mortgage amount and must make up the difference in cash. I think that's what you're trying to say. The problem is that sometimes the buyers don't understand that. And when we explain it to them, they say, I don't have a money tree at home. I told my agent I must have 400,000 or I can't buy this beautiful place. When he or she told me, it, you know, I'm waiving the appraisal contingency, I didn't realize that had anything to do with my mortgage. So what we will do after we explain it to them, if they still are okay with proceeding, we ask them, what's the lowest mortgage you can afford? And usually people have some more money or another source or a parent who will give them a gift. So we'll always ask, add a floor. However, buyers shall not be required to accept a mortgage an amount less than, in my example, 375, let's say. So it's more important from your perspective, if, you, if you're representing the buyer, to explain to them what, what the risks are. The lawyer hopefully will also, but what the risks are by simply saying, you know, the appraisal doesn't matter because it affects the mortgage. And if they need that mortgage, uh, they have to understand that. Okay, with regard to the uh, inspection stuff, I understand it. It's a crazy hot market for sellers and particularly in uh, some areas that have trains going directly to Midtown Manhattan where the exodus seems more palatable to the people that can afford to leave and want to leave. Um, and we see them with $10,000 uh, deductibles or $5,000 deductibles. I get it. Um, I don't usually, and I don't think my colleagues usually interfere with that because it's a good faith business term. It doesn't solve every problem because somebody is going to say, oh, it's way more than 10,000. Someone else is going to say, no, it's not. But at least it does manage expectations a little. So that's not the one that really annoys me personally. It's the other one, which we see very frequently. Buyer accepts the chimney and the fireplace and the furnace as is. End of story. Imagine the parents' reaction when they see that their kids just signed this and how they're going to uh, evaluate the uh, loyalty and ability of the realtor that said it was okay to sign that. We've had chimneys that have cost $40,000 to fix. Sometimes it's just masonry, but sometimes there are actual safety issues and there is carbon monoxide going into the property and the parents of those buyers are thinking about that two-year-old granddaughter that they love moving in here. And guess who just said it was okay to sign this? Well, hopefully the lawyer for the buyer will have experience in this area and know to do something to change the, that wording. Either to say if it's a safety issue, it's exempt from this as is, or maybe a deductible there as well. The buyer will accept up to 5,000 in chimney or whatever, 10,000 in chimney. Certainly at a minimum, we are protecting ourselves as well as we are protecting our clients, pointing out the dangers that could come about by, by this kind of acceptance up front. Iroh, if I could please, because on the real estate commission side, and, and Gary, I think you can talk about this. When you have a listing and you are writing the agents who are going to give an offer and you are putting in your email that they have to waive the inspections, they have to waive the, the quote unquote mortgage contingency. Whose benefit are you looking for, number one? And as a buyer's agent, if you say, yes, that's something you should do, I would never tell somebody not to do a home inspection. I just wouldn't do it because under the law of agency, that protects your buyer. It gives them information as Jeff was talking about with the family and if there's something that's going on. So be careful that you're not violating the rules of agency trying to put a deal together. And as well, Bill, and you know as well as I do, 
Section 6.4 of the Commission's regulations in paragraph B says a listing agent must make a reasonable effort to ascertain all material information about the physical condition of the property and disclose that to a prospective purchaser. And the Commission defines material as anything a reasonable person would want to know before they made a decision to buy. So that that doesn't go away. That, that rule doesn't go away because the buyer is waiving the home inspection requirement, if the listing agent knows there's something wrong with that property, they've got to disclose it. That's absolutely true and, act, and, and important. And some of the agents actually seem to know that because they'll put in the wording uh, chimney and et cetera, as is no known defects. So uh, yeah, but it's a good point. Yeah. Absolutely. Good points by both Gary and, and Bill. While we're still on this, and Bob, I want to preemptively uh, let you know that we do have a couple questions coming up in regards to coming soon. Uh, but while we're still speaking on contracts, uh, can you speak on multiple offer brokerage responsibility? This is a two-part question. That's one part. And then the escalation clauses within the contracts and disclosures regarding the same. I think a few of us could probably speak on that, but um, the escalation clause, frankly, I haven't seen in a while. There was a, there was a time period where it was all over the place. Now I do see them and they're almost always declined. Um, as long, I, I'm not aware of any violation of any uh, rules by using them, uh, provided you explain very carefully to both clients the issues with them and the practicalities with them. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, there is a time where all buyers get burnout. And when they're escalating against each other, it's, fr it's not surprising to me to suddenly find that all three have disappeared. It's kind of like the final and best, everything tomorrow at, at five o'clock. And then, of course, the loser contacts you at 520. Um, so I think it's more about disclosing to your client the, the risks of getting involved in an escalation and in the practical risk of multiple offers going on too long. Because at some point, there's going to be a burnout, there's going to be a, a competing property that goes on the market. And when things don't go right, the, the clients or their parents will turn on you or your agents and find some violations somewhere. And I guess I would just add on for brokers and managers, you can't do this in a vacuum. You need to teach your agents that they have to have a discussion with the seller. I'd prefer if, if I were the broker that it be done during the early portions of the listing. What, how, how do you want us to handle if we get multiple offers? Because, for example, the code of ethics for those of us who are realtors say that I'm not allowed as a listing agent to share information about other offers if they exist unless I have the seller's permission to do so. So first things first, I've got to ask a seller, do you want me to tell buyers about other offers if they come in? Because some sellers might say, absolutely not. If you tell the first buyer I'm working with that another offer is coming in, they might get scared and go away. Other sellers might say, absolutely tell them, because if I'm working with a buyer who's offered me 400, I don't want to be talking to a buyer who's offering me 300. But that's the seller's decision and must be the seller's decision. And too many listing agents out there are basically refereeing these multiple offer situations as though it's their decision, and it's not. You're absolutely right. And one other thing, again, if you're talking about the offers coming in, the law is very specific that all offers have to be presented to the homeowner. Even if you have something in writing from somebody, from the homeowner saying they don't want to see any more offers, if something else comes in just to protect yourself, I would make them aware that there is another offer up until closing. It doesn't matter if it's under contract or if it's closing at 11 o'clock. Your obligation is to make sure that they know that there is an offer on the table. Whether or not they can accept it has nothing to do with it. On top of that, even when you see best and final due at this time on this day, if something comes in after that, it also has to get uh, presented to the seller. As Absolutely. Well. Yeah. And we get a lot of phone calls from very, very upset buyers because they don't understand. And Jeff, you can speak to this as well. Even if the seller said absolutely best and final, okay, you've got it. And then there's still an attorney review and a better offer comes in. The attorney can say, kill that deal. And the buyer's going, well, wait a minute, you promised me I had the house. Well, uh, 
sorry. <laughs> More money takes precedence over my willingness to live up to my word. Am I correct, Jeff? Yes, and we always quote that great New Jersey authority, Yogi Berra. It's not over till it's over. So, Amen. Yeah, and it's not. Love that one. <laughs> All right, Bob, uh, before we go to the coming soon, I have one question. And, I'm, and, and this is a uh, uh, question that we've been asked multiple times. Showing time, can a firm opt out? Yeah, it is possible within the Garden State system to opt out of showing time. Um, if you want to do that, contact the help desk. We can walk you through it. The broker does have to make that decision. We've only had one office completely opt out. They ended up going back in because they had an agent that was using it um, that they weren't aware of. It is possible for individual agents to also opt out of showing time within the showing time system. Um, we've got directions on that too. Um, we can help you accomplish either. Is, can you provide a number or what's the best way for anyone to contact uh, DSMLS for help? Yeah. Tech support by phone is 973-605-1700. And there's also help desk at gsmls.com. Thank you, Bob. Um, before we get to the question, because you mentioned it, the, the question came in my own head, so maybe other people might have the question. Um, you mentioned that an office can opt out and then in that particular case, you had one agent that, well, because of the one agent, the entire office had to opt back in. So the office has to be opted in for an, for the individual agent to be able to um, still participate? That's correct. The office in general has to be opted in. Okay. Um, we don't have an opt out on, on a per agent basis. Um, we're up to almost 28,000 agents now. Um, it's If we need to do that, we can do that. You can opt out within the showing time system, though. Um, that seems to be the better place to do that if it's on an individual basis. Got it. Right? That way people can control their notifications as well, because you do have some people trying to send notices through that service. Um, but it is easy to turn off. Perfect. Thank you, Bob. Sure. Now, uh, back to coming soon, uh, we have a couple of questions that did come in uh, previous to the live session. Uh, highest and best prior to the first showing, what is the best way a firm can handle this if they come across it? Send it to Garden State, right? Uh, on the face, that seems like it, it, it can't. it's not allowed, right? But we would need to talk to the listing office to understand the circumstances. Um, reviewing that here, it seemed like there's just a misunderstanding of coming soon probably, right? You've got houses that can't be shown because they're condemned or something else. It doesn't belong in coming soon just because it can't be shown in that case, right? That's a different circumstance. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Now, another one with regards to coming soon and showing issues. Uh, no appointments available upon the first showing date is a common occurrence. Any suggestions by GSMLS concerning the same? Again, if you reach out to us, so we, we can work with showing time to see what's going on. We, we can also contact the listing office to understand, right? If if they're preventing everybody from showing it, yes, we're, we're going to help them understand what they've done wrong. Um, but you, you've got to, somebody's got to reach out and let us know. Perfect. So we all know now we do have a GSMLS hotline that we can reach out to or the email, uh, just inform them um, and they'll, they're more than willing to help us out with that. And I um, know that um, President Hiro, Commissioner yes. Hanley will vouch for me the commission addresses this specifically in section 64 paragraph F. And again, don't be too impressed. I have the book right in front of me. <laughs> but it does say that a listing agent may not place any unreasonable restrictions on showing the property. So if that's what you think may be happening, the other venue would be to contact the commission, file a complaint, have an investigator at least phone the listing broker and say, what's going on here? Perfect. Thank you, Gary. And in regards to office exclusives and marketing it to the public, what is the GM, GSMLS procedure on that? So Garden State does require that office exclusives where there's no broker cooperation, but also off market, off MLS or um, listings where it's an exclusive, but there is broker cooperation, but for whatever reason, is it going into Garden State MLS? Those still to be filed with us. We do keep a separate file. You can call here and check to make sure that one's been filed. Um, and that will trigger us investigating the office if there's nothing on file. Um, 
we do not have any rules prohibiting the advertising of those listings. Thank you, Bob. Now, I just want to add on, since we only have 15 minutes left, uh, for any of our attendees, I see we have a couple that have recently joined. If you have questions, continue to ask them in the Q&A section. Anything that does not get answered today, we'll bring it to our next section. Uh, but in the meantime, we want to at least address the questions that were asked previous to uh, the live session that we have. Uh, with that, we're going to go into public open houses. Uh, can, an can an agent deny or restrict access to the public who are working with another agent? So in essence, can a listing agent deny access to the public uh, to anyone that's represented already by a buyer's agent? Well, in rehearsal, we, defer we all deferred that one to Jeff. Oh, thanks. <laughs> The answer is no, but I, I, there, there are just so many reasons that the answer is no. I have to, some of them are obvious. I mean, if you've advertised that there is an open, uh, open house to the public, that is the answer to the question. You can't unadvertise what you just advertised. Um, there are more specific examples that I recall came up every day. Maybe one of you two want to join in on that one to rem remind us. Yeah, there was uh, one... Uh, restricting people from showing the house at an open house if you show up with another agent, they're saying that they can't come into the house. You can't do that. Okay, it is an open house. You're opening it to the public. Again, agency, if they're being represented by somebody else, you don't want to get into a situation where you are interfering with their contractual agreement with their client. Thank you for answering that. Now, in reference to referrals, can agents make an agreement absent the broker approval for a referral between firms, and must it be in writing? Um, I, I'll take that one since I'm the broker of record for the New Jersey Referral Network, a subsidiary of NiceJar. Um, the referral arrangement for any commission is always between the two brokers, must always be between the two brokers because it's the broker's commission. So two sales associates who make a deal without discussing it with their manager or their broker could find at the closing that the broker says, I'm not paying a referral fee. No one ever asked me, talked to me, or even discussed it with me. And if the broker is not bound. The, the referral arrangement has to be something that the agent discusses with their broker, the broker discusses with the other agent's broker, and the two brokers agree that they're going to share the commission in that manner because the commission does not belong to the agents, it belongs to the broker, and the broker chooses to share their commissions with their agents as per the agreements they sign when they employ them, but that doesn't give the agent the right to obligate the broker as to how they spend their money. Thank you. Um, Jeff, someone asked if you would please repeat what you write in the contract concerning the, if the buyer's mortgage is approved, but... Okay. Well, this is just my language, but the idea is, I think, universal among my colleagues. What I say is if a buyer's mortgage is approved, but for an amount less than the amount stated in the contract as the mortgage contingency amount, solely due to a low appraisal, the buyer shall be required to accept the lower mortgage that was offered and make up the shortfall in cash. And then if I'm the buyer, I put in that next line to protect them. However, in no event shall they be required to accept a mortgage less than some other number. Okay. I mean, if whoever is asking that uh, needs the actual language, I'm happy to send it at a, you know, another time, Hira. Yeah, Hira, also, we should get back into the habit of what we did years ago, asking for proof of funds. Oh, yes. Because you are writing a contract. You're saying the person has $100,000 extra, but they're an FHA buyer and they're putting down 3%. Right. You know, and I'm not saying anything about how people mortgage or whatever. <laughs> what is the likelihood that they don't have the money? Because when they talk about the percent of the money down, it's the percentage of the appraised price, not of what you want to pay for the house. Your 20% is based on the appraised value, what the bank says it's worth. All the rest has to be cash. And if they don't have the money, again, you're putting your homeowner in jeopardy. And I know that the real estate commission is a place that people just like to call. Right. Well, and Bill, 
and I'm sure you know this, and I'm showing off again, but don't forget, I've got the statute book right here in front of me. Section 6, 4, paragraph B, which is the one that says, as listing agents, we have to make a reasonable effort to ascertain all material information about the physical condition of the property. It also says, as listing agents, we must make a reasonable effort to ascertain the financial qualifications of every person for whom he or she submits an offer to his client, his or her client. So if you allow your seller to take their home off the market for a buyer who's not qualified to buy it, and you as a listing agent didn't do anything to determine that, then technically you're in violation of the commission regulations as well. I just want to throw in uh, on what Bill said about that proof of funds. When, when we're representing a seller in that appraisal mortgage situation, we will always add that sentence, which is that buyers have to show proof of funds now, like during attorney review or within three business days of that difference between the floor and the mortgage amount. In other words, the contract is contingent on a 400,000 mortgage on that 500,000 purchase, but they're willing to uh, take a lower uh, mortgage if because of the appraisal, we will ask for that differential proof of funds because without that, yes, you have a winning lawsuit. Wonderful, you're gonna win. But that doesn't really make the seller so happy when I explain that that's going to be in a year and a half right. after you spend twenty five thousand in legal bills. And do you want every agent in your in your town not to show your property because there's a lawsuit? That's a pretty big stigma. So right. you definitely want the practical proof of funds. Good point. Very good point. Um, I had a question come in uh, that they had a lot of realtors say that they won't present other offers after the best and final. How should that be handled with the realtor? Well, I'll take it because the commission's regulation says that the seller can relieve the listing broker from the obligation to present all offers, including after a contract's agreed to right up to closing, but they have to provide those instructions in writing. The writing has to be made an addendum to the listing agreement, and it must be made available to inspection for inspection to the buyer's agent if they ask to see it. If you don't do that, you violated the commission regulations again. Right. Understand the seller is steering the ship here, not the agent. Exactly. It's the seller. And that's where everybody's losing sight. Who's, who's running the show here? I'm going to get up on my soapbox for a second, um, like Jeff did earlier. I think one of the biggest issues going on here today is that too many of us are allowing other licensees to practice in an illegal or unethical manner, and we don't do a thing about it. You can go to the commission's website and in a minute or two to file an email complaint and the investigators must respond to those. So if somebody's doing something illegal, you should complain about it and they should be brought before the commission and they should be dealt with. And if that happens more often, some of this nonsense will start to go away. If there's something going on with a coming soon, you should call the Garden State. They'll look into it. And if people get fined and the word gets out, some of this sloppiness should start going away. Same thing with the code of ethics. If they violated the code, file a complaint, bring them before a panel of their peers. If they get sanctioned and the word gets out, you'll see less and less of this. Just too many of us are looking the other way or worse. We're complaining, complaining, complaining. But when I say, well, why don't you file a complaint? Uh, I'm too busy for that. So I apologize. That was just me and my soapbox for a minute. Uh, I can say, I mean, I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, and I'm not, I don't think the attendees can see all the questions that are coming in. And I'll just quickly uh, mention, somebody did not mention that. And one of their concerns was, well, it's not anonymous, right? I, my name is out there. And I believe the answer on one of them, I couldn't find it. I was looking for it. But I believe the answer on one of them was that you can fax it and you don't have to put your name on it. Is that correct? You are correct that I have spoken with several of my dear friends who are investigators and they say the only problem is you make our job so much more difficult if we cannot reach out to you and talk to you and ask you questions about the situation to help us better do our investigation. So yeah, you can file an anonymous complaint, but it just makes the job that much tougher for the investigator. And quite frankly, you know, if a person's behaving unethically or illegally, I don't feel any guilt whatsoever in turning them in. I'm sorry. That's our job as realtors in terms of the code of ethics. We have a responsibility to report somebody's unethical behavior. And as far as I'm concerned, I consider part of my job as a realtor to also report them to the commission if that's appropriate. So I understand the reality that nobody wants to be known as the one that throws people under the bus. That's why so much of this nonsense is going on, because there's no consequence for doing it wrong. 
Correct. Thank you. I agree, Gary. True. Uh, yes. Can yes. I, can I can I just do one thing real quick? Sure. Before we finish up, because I notice we only have five minutes, I want to give everybody in the audience a reference resource. So if you've got a pen and a piece of paper handy, um, I'm going to give you four letters and some numbers. The letters are F H E O. So F is in Frank, H is in Harry, E is in education, O is in Oscar. Dash two zero two zero dash zero one. What I want you to do is I want you to go to the HUD site, hud.gov, type those numbers in the search window, and get a copy of the directive that HUD issued last January regarding service animals. Over 70% of all the complaints HUD deals with these days has to do with discrimination against someone on the basis of a physical handicap. And more often than not, it's because they're being discriminated against because their physical handicap requires them the use of a service animal. And ladies and gentlemen, a service animal is not a pet. And that particular directive defines what a service animal is. It doesn't have to be a seeing eye dog that performs a task. It could simply be an animal that the doctor says provides therapeutic emotional support. So it's a multi-page document that goes into great detail. And as a broker or manager, I'd make sure every single one of my agents had a copy. If you do any kind of rentals and you've got a landlord running around saying, I don't take pets because a service animal is not a pet. Wow, that thank, was, you, thank you, Mr. President. That is a big one. And thank you for that reference. I wrote it down myself. <laughs> uh, with, I think we may have time for one more. Uh, true or false? Once an attorney review, if a new offer comes in, can the buyer's agent ask for the seller's attorney's info to present the offer directly? Does, uh, doesn't the listing agent have to give that information? Or does the listing agent have to give that information? I would think yes. Uh, I don't know of a ruling one way or the other, but it happens frequently and I've never had anybody object to it. I mean, certainly, as you all know, until attorney review is completed, which is really not an accurate legal statement, it, because once attorney review letter has gone out disapproving, there is no contract. So until there is a contract, there's a duty to cooperate in all reasonable regards. And I would think giving the identity of a lawyer might be a, a one way to cooperate. I guess human nature plays a role that uh, if somebody doesn't like that particular lawyer, the listing agent might say, oh God, that lawyer is so slow or that lawyer is so annoying, but I, I haven't come across that yet. So I would say, why look for trouble? Just give the name. I mean, I, I don't really. Well, and also there's one other thing before Gary corrects me, uh, <laughs> which is uh, oftentimes people say who their lawyer is and it doesn't turn out to be that person. I get calls every day from people I never hear again because my colleague down the street is $5 cheaper. So, Well, I was just going to say to hitchhike on Bill's comment earlier, keep in mind it's the seller who steers the ship. And unlike Jeff, who charges peanuts, he's the cheapest <laughs> attorney you can find out there, there are attorneys that charge a lot of money. So a listing agent should ask the seller, may I have your permission to give the name of your attorney? Because the attorney may charge the seller for looking at that next offer. And the seller may say, no, 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 no. You, you have them give it to you. You and I will look at it and we'll decide if we're going to get my attorney involved because unlike Jeff, my attorney charges way, way, way lots of money. Iro, can I just add one thing on a different subject? The, the person sure. asked earlier about the drug offenses, whether I just checked uh, the, the statute. It's NJSA 2C colon 52-2. Um, 52, 2C colon 52-2. And I don't see any drug offenses listed among those that are non, um, non uh, that, that can't be expunged. I mean, you're talking about criminal homicide, kidnapping, human trafficking, you know, sex with a child, terrorism, chemical weapons. So I believe that they're all from what I just glanced at, that drug offenses um, are not indictable and therefore um, could not be considered if they, you know, as, as reasons to deny somebody. Hey, I appreciate you for looking that up and getting that uh, back to the, uh, the person that asked that earlier uh, before we finish up. Uh, 
I'm, there's a lot of questions. I love that so many questions came on. Again, know that we're going to take these um, and bring them to the next session. Um, I thank you all for being here. I want to just quickly say in wrapping this up that it's been uh, an amazing time for me personally. I hope you all took away as much as I did from it. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us today. I want to also uh, thank the panelists for taking their time out of the crazy busy schedules to give us a lot of their insight. Uh, as you can see, they're obviously a great reflection of some of the amazing individuals that we have within our industry, not only in our industry, but here within our association. Uh, then lastly, obviously, this event would not have been possible without the help of all of our wonderful staff at North Central Jersey Association of Realtors. Uh, thank you for helping us learn from each other, for all of us coming together today as one family. Be safe, be well, and be good to everyone. With that, ladies and gentlemen, see you on the next one.